Good evening, parents, and welcome, and uh, a delight to welcome back Dr. Scarlett Matoli to West Island and this webinar entitled Digital Dialogues. I spoke to Dr. Scarlett Matoli a while back, and we were talking about some of the challenges that we face as parents. And one of the themes that I was sharing with her and subjects that we try and manage as best we can as parents is managing online platforms with our children. And I know that uh, speaking as a parent myself, it can cause sometimes frustration and tension and concern regarding your child's safety. And when I was speaking to Dr. Scarlett, she shared with me that she had devised a family programme for parents and their children to uh, develop some better understanding of how digital platforms can exist within a family um, and be part of that family network rather than working against it. So I'd ask Dr. Scarlett if she could spend some time with us this evening talking through the family program that she has on offer. And she's very kindly offering to hold this at West Island starting next term. Um, we can give some details at the end. And as a school, we're very happy to support those families that wish to participate. So we thought this evening it would be a great opportunity for Dr. Scarlett to share her insight into this program. And at the end of this, if you've got any questions, we'll take those. Um, and we can move from there. So Dr. Scarlett, lovely to see you again. I'm going to turn off my camera and um, I'll join you at the end. Lovely, thank you very much and good evening all. It's wonderful to be back with you again this evening. Um, I'm glad that we have parents interested in this topic. Uh, as uh, Claire had mentioned, that they're definitely about um, looking at how we can uh, work with our children as opposed to against them or see them as anything other than our friends. Uh, so we'll start off tonight by going to, oops, jumping ahead there on the screens. Give me one second. Start sharing that one. Oh, let's see if I can get it going. Hmm. Bear with me one second. Get that back up. All right. Just trying to get this started. Sorry, guys. There we go. Finally. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks for joining tonight. And this is Digital Dialogues um, that we're talking about tonight. It does have a lot of components that we will be um, speaking about generally. But for this particular program, it's a six week program and we'll go into a little bit more details at the end. Um, but we want to look at what are the usual things that come up when we talk about working with children and online lives. So we are the non-digital natives, anyone over about 25 years old. Uh, we didn't grow up with this in our household. So let's have a look at what our assumptions are. Um, a lot of us think it's coming from addictions. Now there's a lot of literature that started around this in the late 90s. And I'll just hit on that quickly uh, to dispel some myths. And then we'll look at how can we take a different perspective. Um, touch on teen development. Again, these are all the components that would be in the six week program. So I want to start giving you a little taste of what might happen. We'll look at tech trends very quickly because it is important to get our head in there. Um, and then we'll go on to a quick overview of the program and look at how we like to carry on. So moving along, the first one is uh, when people come to talk to me about this, uh, they think that um, there's something else going on um, that I'm trying to diagnose them. For the most part, when I'm speaking with other people, I really just want to know what's happening, yeah? Because we do need to develop a clear picture. And this is something that we forget when we go out into the world to talk to our children or anyone else. Not everyone is trying to figure out what's going on. Yet for our children, we usually are. We're trying to diagnose them a little bit, right? And we also think that, that we understand everything that goes on in the mind. But the truth is we don't. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going on. And lots of parents want tips and tricks and all kinds of quick fixes. It's not really what happens. We might understand human behavior and the whole breadth of it, or as much as I can learn. I don't know all of it, freely admitted. Um, but we do have to go in and invite 
each person's individual perspective so that we can understand. I can't read minds. I don't think anybody else can. I'd love to meet them if they could. I think that would be interesting. I personally think that would be about the worst talent ever. Wouldn't want to know that. But what I do come from is a nice history of research. I do want to know if I look at this enough times, what happens? Uh, what is that result? Statistically speaking, is it significant? And this is the base of the literature I work from, especially when it comes to digital lives. We have only 20 years of this collated, and my goodness, we have more data than we've ever collected before. And in the last year, I think we've upped that by another 10%, if not more. So just a quick one to check on how are your skills at looking at things? We've got a little bit of a film here and anyone who's seen it before, don't give it away for the other people, but we'll look quickly. It just takes a few minutes. Let's see if as long as I can get it to play. Otherwise I'll describe to you what happens. Clearly somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. So when we're looking at that, I do hope you could hear it. But this one is actually visual. So if you couldn't, it still kind of works. What we have are a lot of assumptions going on. And what happens in the background are things that we can't see. Some of you might have noticed some things, but there were quite a bit of things that changed. Let's have a look. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. So, are we looking at internet addiction or not when we look at our children? Uh, this is one of the bigger questions that comes out of it, but I hope you notice from that video, we can see that there were 21 changes that happened. And when that camera is focused in on the one thing, the one thing it wants to show you or it wants to direct your attention to, we miss a lot of other data that's going on. Now we know that internet addiction has about the same thing. It started out in 1998, actually a little bit before that, it was a bit of a spoof diagnosis. But the lovely lady named Dr. Kimberly Young took it to heart and she actually created the internet addiction test. Now we have to remember in 1998, uh, sorry, uh, we had limited internet um, access that was dial-up modems. It was very expensive. It was time consuming. If you wanted to get online, you really had to want to do it. There wasn't that much to get onto either. Um, so this was a clear definition of addiction. She looked at it first by aligning it with our, um, with the then uh, diagnostic and statistical manual uh, criteria for um, the compulsions, people who couldn't stop doing something. And she aligned it with 20 different um, criteria that said, if you're trying to get online when you aren't supposed to be, when you're spending more time thinking about it than not, when you are offline, you're thinking about getting online, a lot of pretty straightforward stuff. Some of it still actually stands today and is quite useful. But we wouldn't say that one of those criteria, spending more time than intended online, necessarily matters anymore. We know that we're all spending on time online every day. Now, the other thing that we know can be addiction is caffeine. We have coffee, people who drink loads of coffee. Now, this has been legal for a long time. It's readily available. We all put it in our bodies in some form or another, whether it's chocolate. Some people can't have it. I appreciate that. But we don't regulate this. We take on a lot, but it's actually a, an addiction. Uh, we do have people who have caffeine addiction. 
And we have learned more recently um, that while we know that it helps us focus, we've actually got pictures of what happens now. We can see here these areas are lighting up more diffusely. And once we have a bit of caffeine, it gives us a lot of focus in that prefrontal cortex. And I love this one here. It looks like the brain is on fire. And what we can see is it kind of calms down the activity. We also know that completely legal, if you're over 21 or 18, depending on the country, are things that we've discovered a long time ago as well, freely put into our body and we let do different things. But we know with too much exposure, we have other things that go on in our brain. We can see for 15 year olds that there's less activity and over prolonged use, it actually robs brain cells, uh, diminishes in size, reduces the amount of liquid we have in there. So when we look forward, we can see here as well, this is the corpus callosum that helps the two brain halves talk to each other. And these are our central ventricles. As you can see, these are getting larger over time. These are actually very close to the same systems though, that can get hijacked if we do have an internet addiction scenario. And it does exist for a very small portion. But as we can see here, even with alcoholism, one of our first, it's the chemical that does the difference. And that's what changes our brain. But the pathways are still there. Um, you know, some say I've learned so much from my mistakes. I think I'm making a few more. Uh, well, we certainly know children are trying to put their energy towards this sometimes, but we all are in this day and age. We're certainly taking increasingly larger amounts over a longer period of time than we originally intended, all of us universally. And in the last year, this has certainly just prolonged the way we live. So we think of an addict as being having too much, too much over time, more than anticipated, more than we thought we could, and being unable to stop. Now, does that make us addicted if we're staying online? Does it make a teenager addicted? Does it make them unable to leave it? Well, we also have to consider that their brains aren't quite like adults, right? But we do know for real addiction, uh, we have a decline in dopamine receptors. We start off with, at first is kind of pleasurable, we actually kind of like it. We like that taste of wine or the taste of coffee. And then when we don't have it, we get cravings. And then we kind of binge, not all of us, some of us, but there's less pleasure. So we get more and then it leads to further binging. So there's a decline, this downward spiral. So what started off as liking just turns to wanting, a generalized diffuse sense of it with no thinking involved at all. And this was from Canton Berridge, the 1970s. It's actually on mouse models. Um, but they discovered that there was something that switched here. And this is the piece that we look for more often when we're looking at uncontrollability. But we have to be careful when we start to look at brains that aren't fully developed yet. Are they really being taken over or are they just doing what comes naturally? Yeah, we can see the end result of the behavior. If we try and take it away, they get very upset. But this doesn't mean that they're addicted or that they can't stop. Their brains are just doing what they were designed to do, more learning fast and going with the reward system. So we have to take perspective on this and think about what is it that is making them happy. Now, as I said before, when we're only looking for one piece of it, um, we may not see the whole picture, especially when we have it on multiple devices today. Everything is linked up, but do we really see our whole shopping list? Do we really see our whole uh, phone book? We used to have filofaxes, at least I did in the 80s, and I could see everybody that I needed to be connected to, or even my Rolodex. Now we do it with our kids, multiple devices, working at home, studying from home, all online at the same time. As a matter of fact, we all got used to being online very quickly last year and larger and larger groups, actually a little bit more than that 150 people that, um, that Gladwell referred to as a classic group. And once we got more than that, we would splinter off. We can go quite large, but eventually we do switch off, not just splinter off. We can't keep track of everything. And we all know even the cat gets bored after a while. We've all been online too long. So when we look at an actual um, a meeting that goes on today, we know even for ourselves, it's probably very little content. Now this is a bit of a silly uh, diagram, but relief at seeing other human beings has certainly happened at the last year, checking out coworkers' houses. That's awesome. Removing cat from the keyboard. Children are required to do the same thing at school, but they now are spending all time online, all time with their friends, all time with parents too sometimes, yeah? And this is the result, that we're all a bit overwhelmed. Um, we're only half ourselves. We're not getting ourselves professionally ready for it. Um, and we certainly aren't keeping track of things. We start to get splintered off a bit from what we used to feel was there. So the one thing children have learned to do is to search for their friends online. They do go for each other there. 
whereas we're suffering a bit more because we still want to meet in person. Yeah, we don't have the exercise we used to. And for some kids, they need a little bit of motivation. For us, we're gasping for it, perhaps, if it was a part of our life before. But we also know that most of us would rather just sit down and take care of ourselves someday and not have to worry about all this nonsense, especially when it comes to parenting kids and their digital devices. So we thought we've got a good hybrid going. Parents didn't want to become teachers this year. I know that that's not anything that we really wanted to learn how to do, but we've done it. We've all risen to the challenge. We've probably seen more of our children's lives than we ever have in the past. Um, might be a little bit uncomfortable for them, but we have become more aware of where the difficulties are. We've had some gentle learning around the children if they didn't understand maths, or maybe they're a bit slower reader. Perhaps you've gained some new appreciation for this and learned to help them a little bit more. But we also know that we're still not communicating fully. Um, and this is one of the biggest parts of being on a team, um, that we all have to understand the rules before we start and then understand when they're about to be executed and then confirm that we just did them together afterwards. Otherwise, accidents happen. Now with teenagers, they don't always have the rules and their life is shifting every day. Ours, pretty stable. We have our values in place. We know what needs to get done. We have the bigger picture in mind, or do we? What we do know is that sometimes we think the child is being addicted, other times they're being belligerent or willful, and other times we just have flat out worries coming straight out of our imagination about what they might be doing online. When the truth is they're just trying to connect with friends on any platform that their parents aren't on. They don't want you to friend them. But we see all the pieces. It's really hard to see the whole. And the whole is the family unit, not just who your child is in that moment, not just which value you feel that they're not fulfilling. And this is one of the biggest parts that we do in the digital dialogues, as we try and take this step back and actually have a look at what could we do now. We have to get to that place called Theory U, where we start off not just downloading, how was your day? What did you do? What are your grades? But where we try and see with the fresh eyes, where we try and get back in touch with the student. Now, as I sort of shared in a talk a couple of weeks ago, they don't necessarily want to share with us all their new stuff because they're still trying it on. It's still clunky and uncomfortable in some senses. And some other things they've already adopted, they may know that we don't approve of. So this isn't really a time where we want to connect. But when it comes to the digital world, it is a place where we need to. This is a part of all of our lives. We're all doing it all day long. This is not an addiction, it's a reality. And we need to start getting to grips with that. Now, the difference is, is that we have different perspectives on what's necessary. So even if we look at people who get addicted, we know that this little part of the brain here is still rewarded, it's still firing off, it's still getting us going. Whether we have them or not, they're just more diffuse. But when it comes to being with our family, we should be firing off pretty much in the same way about being with them, but we don't always do that. Now, one of the easiest ways is to anchor in on self-compassion first. I think we should give it to other people all the times, but one of the biggest parts is stepping up back into yourself. And we have to think about a little bit of self-kindness. Now, there's a benefit in teaching this to children at the same time we're teaching it to adults, if it's not a part of your repertoire, because everyone has to stop and say what's okay. I'm okay with myself and it models for the child how they can be okay with themselves too, even where it's uncomfortable or changing or unsure. And then we increase that connectedness. We need to remember not just that between us, uh, we make mistakes between our children as parents and families um, and systems, but that the whole world is learning at the same time. This lovely worldwide experiment that we've had allows us to connect in all kinds of different ways. Learning that, hey, we don't like being online all day long and looking at the screen. And in doing so, one of the key elements is taking the time out by coming to the class as parents and children, we're being purposefully mindful of what's happening in that moment. It's not an instant connection. We do have to work at it. But if everyone comes in with the same agenda, that same stepping back and big purpose, we don't mistake it for anything else. We don't go into it just touching the ear of the elephant or the tail and expecting something different to come out of it. Yeah, and we also have to keep in mind that their brain is still forming. It's a wonderful time of synaptic exuberance is what they call it. And it's a wonderful word for it. Um, we have to think of them as going through so many pieces of development all at the same time. And this whole front piece here is getting rapidly connected up. Not all of those connections are useful, but we need to get all those last ones synced up before we lose them. 
So we've got layers and layers and layers that go down. Again, we'll go into this just in a little bit more detail so you understand why teens uh, cells aren't connecting quite like ours are and why some of them are a little bit more diffuse. Um, but we can see as well that as we get into this more mature state, um, we know what they're doing. But around 15, even back somewhere in between 12, there's still lots of connections going on. Not a lot of meaningful connections though, more to come. But we see over time, that as they become myelinated, or we can see these darker areas here, they become more efficient at what they're doing and better. And this includes prefrontal cortex, which houses our um, initiation, planning, inhibition, motivation, emotion control, working memory, all kinds of great things that they're still developing and that they would certainly need to hold off on texting all day to their friends. They don't have it in place yet. Is removing it the only option? No, because what they're doing is developing connections. So they need to practice. We need to give them a safe place to practice in. So they're working on mission, I'm possible, while we're working on mission impossible. Can these two places meet? Is it something that we can find together when we have one value and we think that they're trying to throw it back in our face or not honor it? Or we think that we're on the same page and they just can't hear us. It depends. As long as we can remember all the stuff that they're going through, right? they're moving from between stages, major stages of understanding the world, where they really are trying to go into deeper studies, get used to um, deeper thinking, definitely trying to find out who they are um, and who their friends are and how they trust them, uh, especially when every friend is changing every day. One day they'll come dressed goth, the next day they'll come dressed as a nerd. You don't even recognize your friends from day to day because they're trying on their other personalities. It is very discomforting. We do have to give them time and realize that when they come home each day, they've had a million experiences they can't describe to us. Friends that they thought were friends that are online maybe come back and show them up as being not quite a good friend. So they're learning constantly in ways we can't imagine. And it's probably best that we don't remember them, best that we keep just the connections we have and give them a safe space. But remembering as well that they're going to third parties. Now, that's all the media or the internet is full of third parties, other people who are happy to give their opinion and definitely have all kinds of personality traits that your child wants to cash in on, learn about, experience, feel, and decide how they feel about it. Um, yeah, there's a lot there. I won't go into that today. We'll go into that more in the game. But here we also need to think about puberty going on, body growth systems, um, all kinds of embarrassing things happening to our bodies. Many girls and boys today are not sitting with it comfortably. As literature grows on the internet, they're questioning who they are. What used to just be a stage of personality development has now opened up into questioning what gender we are. I think there's a lot of questions out there. I never thought that was one. Apparently it is now. So we have to listen to it. A lot of good research coming out of all of it. What we used to think of as normative cognitive development has also expanded. It used to just be get your sensory perception online, develop your motor skills, get a good attention. The executive functions come online as we get language. Uh, we improve at our visual spatial abilities as we go through school and our memory abilities improve as well. We also have to have that social emotional development, awareness of our own emotions first, and then we can manage our own we reach out to others socially and we gain awareness of theirs. And then we make decisions that are good about how we're gonna connect with other people. And we're gonna manage those relationships effectively. This one has been removed a little bit because it all happens online with an emoji. We're losing our ability to judge what's happening on another person's face. So taking time to go back and spend time with children and just figure it out instead of just with a scowl, what have you done now? Um, they need to see a fuller range. So we also explore how could that happen, yeah? And when we look at school age children, we expect them to handle transitions, think about their consequences, manage frustration, um, express their feelings in appropriate ways and persist in challenging tasks or ask for help if they need it. Today, lots of this stuff is out the window. It's all online and they can ask Dr. Google. They can find a translator to do the Spanish homework for them and they can get anything from math to science tutoring in a second. So. Wow, that doesn't help them learn. It just helps facilitate them get the right answers. So we have to be careful what we're looking for as well. When we want to teach them executive function, the planning, the organization, all of that, it takes more time. To get all of these areas connected up, we have to go back and start again for some of these children. And we have to take a step back together. And as parents, 
they might be willing to do this with you. We have to do it through their language and their world though, hence the digital dialogues. We have to let them lead us a little bit, let them be the experts a little bit, because it is their world, it's not ours. We've learned, we've adapted, um, some of us, <laughs> not all of us and not in every way, but we definitely have to get our attention sustained in order to model what we'd like to see coming out of theirs. We have to persist to complete a task. Have you ever tried playing one of their games with them and understood how long it took, how frustrating it can be, or how rewarding it can be? There's all kinds of ways that we learn to take care of ourselves and manage little wins during the day. So also that planning and time management, critical things for homework. There's an app for that today. Are they really developing these skills? Who knows? But what we do know is eventually it used to give on to response inhibition, where we think before we act, used to give us emotion control so we could manage them. Now we can just cut someone off and delete them when we're unhappy, swipe left or whatever it is. Uh, getting them to, to, uh, to stay on task, that sustained attention. It does take more time now because everything happens in a second. Even movies, the best movies now don't really leave you with a scene for more than about three seconds before it moves on. No French movies for these kiddos. And goal-directed persistence, trying to finish the task. They only do it when they've got some kind of intangible reward. So how do we motivate them with tangible ones again? We have to think about the whole system that they're setting in. We have to think about that micro system now, which is their friends and currently exists in their phone or on their laptop or any other device. And then we can move out to the other systems, but they don't get the chance to do it as much because this has become quite flattened. When we think of all the information that's out there, these hierarchies of adults and children have sort of meshed together now. And we do want to protect our children, but it's hard to know which ones are safe. Hence, if we start the dialogue with them, they might be willing to share with us a bit more or include us, even though, as I said before, they don't want to be on Facebook and they certainly don't want to friend us. There are other ways. So we have to think about the way that we are evolving. We have people who are learning how to use the internet for the first time, using fewer areas where people using the internet for um, a shorter period of time, but with the younger brain are activating more areas. They're getting more linked up in ways that we're not. So even just on a naive net search, uh, a naive internet search here, reading test, we've got less areas light up than an internet savvy person. So it seems there might be some benefits in using more areas of our brain more quickly. We don't know yet. We're still researching this, but we know with vision, language, and sensory motor that's sort of stretching off up here, it's more than that internet naive person. So they seem to be getting more in a virtual world and our brain has the capacity. It's not all just about what we feel, even though real feeling is quite good. So if we look very quickly at how technology has expanded, uh, 1900s, well, we had books, plays, journals uh, for those who could afford it and those who had the education to access it. By the 1950s, we made it a lot more accessible. And so this flattening of the world and letting everybody have access was probably that first step to getting everybody on the same page. You too can have it. So by the time we come to just a decade ago, we're gone. This is it. It's all the way into social media, smartphones, everything at your fingertips. And when we look at the generational side, just that age group differential, also important to consider that this has gone astronomically quickly, not this, or is this very slow development? We had time to think about what we were doing before we did it, time to incorporate it into our lives and time for it to sort of trickle down effect into society. Now things are all available immediately. We haven't had time to reflect on them or think if they're good or not. And we certainly don't have any way to police them as we did with alcohol and other things. This is just there and available. So is there one app that does it all? Not really. Even our brains aren't completely immune to it. But when we look at the technology trends and usage, this data is a little bit old. We can see that some of the nations have gone up a little bit faster than others. And when we look at the saturation level, how many peoples have gone online, we can see pretty much um, large proportions of that internet use get uh, sucked into it fairly quickly. And when we go by social media, now this is the biggest part. It's not just about that dial up modem and getting online to the few people who are there to chat with at a very expensive rate. It's available in seconds. It's instantaneous. And we can see with this growth, both between our, our age bands and how the early adopters are getting in now, it's much quicker. It's not like buying a car. Yeah. And this one, just a quick one to give us reasons for internet use and get us back in it. 
this is teens in the 2015, just a few years back, they already said that it was education, entertainment, and social networking. And some research I did a few years back in Hong Kong on adults, even when we just looked at how they use the internet, on it for 90% of the day, but for banking, books, music, it's really the center of our lives now. So we can't really pathologize our children or think that they're being belligerent and being interested in it. We've all got a little bit of that going on. When we just look at some changes in numbers, Facebook's still the top one here, but we can see this number is just exponentially growing. In some cases, um, we still have Facebook, WhatsApp, Messenger dominating, but Instagram jumped up from 500 million to about to 1 billion. We have users doubling, and this is from 2016 to 2019. So in only a few years, the growth and the uptake is beyond what we can comprehend um, and just that. Whereas Twitter didn't really increase that much, um, but it's, it hasn't moved down. Uh, Snapchat has fallen off, but we have the other one, TikTok has shown up here with a half a million, probably even more than that after the last year, depending on who has it left. But it's not just down to the country users, it's down to people everywhere. Who wants to take it up? So we have to look across the world. 99% of people use their smartphone now. Uh, we know that we're connected. Um, half of the world is connected in some way or another. But we have to think our paradigm going with uh, internet, email, um, Facebook, all of these, our kids said, we don't want it, right? It's not that they don't wanna to talk to us. We're all on the same platforms, but it's not where they want to be. And we have to remember with teens, as I mentioned earlier, it's because they really just don't want to be with their parents. They need the privacy to try on new things and fail. So how do we get in there? How do we tell them it's okay to share a little bit with us? Because we're your parents and we're going to put the boundaries around you. You're going to have to still reflect our values. So we have to look what our team's doing. Current data, 2018 is the last one on this one, um, that people, 70% in the US, 13 to 17 year olds are using their phone almost constantly. Very small percentage don't use social media. And when we look at teens and what they're doing, YouTube definitely has a big portion of it. They have Instagram going on there and Snapchat. These are their fast places. Facebook, I'm sure, is far behind that now, as is Twitter. But what we have here, mostly positive effect or neutral. So the majority of teens, when they're reporting on how they feel they've used it, connecting with friends, feel that it's got a good benefit for them. Quarter, okay feel that it's mostly negative that they're bullying rumors are spreading unrealistic views that it's causing distractions or even leading to that level of addiction or peer pressure so we know that there there is and this is self-reporting there is good evidence that some are not experiencing well but the fact that they've reported this tells us that if we take the time to be aware and ask and be present we might be able to hear this a bit earlier and get in there and help them with that or at least put them with a good third party, according to their age, who they're willing to listen to and work with. So what do we want? We want to look at this. These are just spec imaging, looking at the number of cells firing off with even just alcohol, all the other things. We can see that our brains are not functioning. A normal brain without anything put into it is like that. Nobody's brain is completely like this anymore, but they're not putting chemicals into their brain as often. They really are going online most of the time and trying to connect with other people. They're primed to do it. That's what their brain was made to do at this time. So if they're still spending time together, but online, is it okay that together are partners? Hmm, we'd rather see them together, but this is what we'd like to see. Now we know in this last year hasn't happened as much as we'd like. We'd love to see them connecting with each other, but this is a full sense of what really happens with a group of girls and teenage girls, especially. Uh, we know there's all kinds of stuff going on, but we really want it to only be physical Maybe there's a place for social media to help with these students to communicate carefully with their words, to think cautiously about what they're doing. And it starts here within the home. If it is in our value system and we take the time not to speak at them, to speak, but to speak with them as budding young adults who are the future. They are our future. They're the future um, healthcare workers. They're the future teachers. They're, they're our future. So let's make sure that we treat them with the respect that we would treat anyone else that we would be dealing with in a few years help them understand that we respect them as young budding adults. So let's just take a quick check in. How tech savvy are you? Quick test. I'm going to show you some things here. Just have a quick think and see if you know what those mean. Let's see how switched in you are. These aren't that new, 
So I'm hoping all of you can get it. I'll just give you a couple minutes. You can write them down, screenshot, see what you come up with. Some of them aren't so nice. I'll share it with you in advance. But these are the sort of things that I hear children doing or I see in some of the text messages that they share with me on their phone, not on mine. So I'm gonna to go to the next screen now, no spoilers. So laugh out loud, I think you probably all had that. Will you call me? I hadn't heard that one before, but clearly it said frequently enough online, they got an acronym. I want sex now, wow, that is a big one. I would not have thought that that would be coming up, but apparently it comes up with young kids as well. CD9, parents, uh, parents are around, sorry. Code nine, parents watching. 99, parents gone. Uh, parent over your shoulder, POS. Come, I, I had lots of other things that I thought they were the first time I saw them. Let's try one more here. Lots of slang that we've seen. Uh, cheddar for money, uh, greatest time of all, Gucci, cool. Uh, probably you've heard of these before, so children are using the words. But when we go over here, these start to get a little bit worse because these could be coming from adults. So one of the first things that we want to look at is getting children to be very honest about which ones they're using. Lots of children have found that it's much easier to have um, a second account, and it's very hard to police for these. So we certainly want to make sure that we're keeping better track of what our children have and where they're going, because all of these could lead somewhere else that we really don't want them to have. And this is the stuff we want to be aware of. Probably less than that 25% that we're actually doing these. So where to now? Where are the tips and guidance? Where is that lovely tick list sheet or that app that's going to block everything for you? I know you're gasping for it. I don't have it. <laughs> what I do have, again, is a safe place to think and to step back. And it's got to be the first place. It's not fast. Children growing up is not fast. But a lot of people feel that urgency as though they're just about to head out the door and be terrible, awful, horrible people. It's not true. They're wonderful. They're your children. But the first one we have to do is establish clear boundaries, reasonable boundaries for the internet and tech use. I think everyone's well familiar now with the strategies of trying to do a contract. It's great. Your team will sit and listen to you for half an hour. They'll sign it and then go off and do something different. So it's really about saying what is reasonable, not from your terms, from theirs. What can they really commit to? And we definitely want to step up the systems of monitoring and ruling um, and sorry, the rules that are in the household very much tied to values so the children understand you're not just saying no, you've got a bigger picture. And if they really do feel that it's, it's unfair or there's something that's unrealistic about it, hear them out. Even if you don't agree in the end, help them understand why it can't sit there. These are conversations worth having. They're about to be the adults and they can communicate with the world at will. If we don't teach them to take the time to talk it out, they're not gonna learn it from anyone anymore. So we also need to look at those consequences for non-adherence. Is just removing the phone the answer? Before, we would just go over to our friend's house and play with their Atari game or watch their TV. Today, I don't know. I know some kids that have burner phones. Don't know where they got them, but they have them. We have to be a little bit more serious about this. If we just go to delimiting things, we risk them just finding a way around it. They're not worried about earning money and paying rent and thinking about all that stuff now. Their brains are primed to think around problems quickly and efficiently. Is this really the battle we want to have? Might not be the best way to go. So we have to monitor the rules in a realistic way. They're constantly going to be changing with children in this day and age. You've seen those jumps in social media, just the platforms alone. We have to respond realistically. We can't be learning it the whole time. Let them do all the work just create a good flow for communication. And again, when the consequences are clear at the outset, it's easier to say, ah, we made that rule. It looks like you've crossed that boundary. You know what happens next. And it's easier to make that very real. It's in the real world. Again, we have laws in place. We don't have to worry about it. We don't throw that in our child's face every day. Don't steal a car. It's against the law. They just probably aren't going to do it. So let's make everything else just as real. Where does it need to be anchored? What makes it the thing that they need to pay attention to? So that modeling your behavior, what you're doing as well is really important. If you're saying don't go online and then spending all night online, okay, your choice, you've worked all day, you need to communicate with people and have your downtime too. Understand that that might be their space. You think they've spent all day online? They have, maybe for school, maybe for other things, but getting that realistic check-in is the best place to go. 
we need to check on it. So tons of places like this. This is one from uh, Virginia, family tech checklists. They go through about the same things. We don't ever move too far off of these rules. Um, that just becomes a new thing that we can block our children's things with every day. But it's a game of leapfrog. As soon as you figure out one, there'll be some smart, savvy person who gives all the kids a tip online and the next day they can jump over it. It can be exhausting for us uh, non-digital natives, really can. So let's look at good websites where we've got the best information, follow it together with our children, not as policemen checking on our children. Try and have a clear understanding of what it is they're looking at and why you might put a block on them. Also the six week um, course that we can try together, you're welcome to come in anytime. I think Claire's gonna give you some more information afterwards. Just to give you a quick rundown, it's parent and child. It has to be interactive. If you can't do it at home, we'll provide the place, but let's make it happen together. Let's open up with the current picture in your home. We've got some gentle, gentle games that we'll play to sort of figure out what that looks like. Um, week two, we'll look into development. We'll end it for everybody. We'll remind teens what they're going through and remind adults. And look at how this is not addictions. This is the brain being taken over sometimes for sure, but they need to take help when they when they need it and when they can't recognize it for themselves. In week three, we call it the splitting atoms, but really it's about how can we look at all the different ways that we can break it down into what we need, going to those parts so we can build up a better whole. Week four, we look at boundaries and rules. That is the best way. We're gonna do that through play. So be prepared to play some games. And in week five, we look at, once you've got all this information, we're gonna pull it together and I'll help you. You won't be alone. I and my team are very good at this. Uh, we'll look at what's the reality that you've arrived at today, start making some plans and we'll help you with that action plan and how to monitor and how to keep it going in the household. This doesn't take very long. Six weeks is a very short space of time in your lives and it gets you potentially a very different result. And for the younger children, it's a great time to start intervening and helping them understand there's a different way and to trust the adults around them. So we hope you can take on board that there are changes in brain activity um, that make for relatively predictable behavior, behavior, but unpredictable at the same time. They're the most vulnerable ones and the largest population of users right now. And the communication patterns, we can't keep up with it. They're just as rapid as brain changes in the teenage brain. Our brains do adapt quickly. And this is an inherent reward system that can be hijacked a little bit too easily in younger brains. So we need to watch them and take care. But we do need to help them increase their ability to manage that desire, the seeking behaviors, and how to monitor and control their own use. That is what their brain is designed to be doing at this time. This is the perfect exercise to use to do it in. So thank you for listening. I'm going to give you your brains back for all that time. And now I'd love to know what kind of questions we've got for the group. I'll stop sharing. And we'll go back to Claire. Thanks, Dr. Scarlett. I, you know, just listening to you and um, as a parent who has a busy day and I walk in and I see my child on, on something, a computer, et cetera, sometimes um, I fill in the gaps um, and, and make the wrong assumptions. And there's one thing you said towards the end, um, the opportunity of this course allows us to take time to be aware and be present and to provide a safe space, a, a non-judgmental space to open up the dialogue. And I think if there is an opportunity to open up that flow of communication, as you say, that no matter what the, the trending social media platform is or, or, or changing times, that you've got that constant that anchor so um thank you so much for that in terms of the sessions parents we can give you some more details um, tomorrow and we'll send a form out but we are offering from wednesday the 21st of april from 4 to 5 30 p.m for those parents that can make that and um, that maybe don't have a work commitment at that particular time and acknowledging that we have parents that are working long hours during the week. Dr. Scarlett and her team are also offering Saturdays and that will start from the 24th of April. And that would be from three to 4.30 p.m. And as Dr. Scarlett said, that that would be for both um, yourself and your child. So very much uh, interactive and um, a, a team, a team approach to that. And 
Dr. Scarlett, no questions coming in. So I think I think you have answered maybe people's questions on what the webinars are about. Um, please get in touch. Um, we've had an, a large number of parents talk to us and approach us about online usage, not just during COVID, which I know has compounded some frustrations and feelings about online use, but prior to that as well. So I think this is a great opportunity for parents um, to engage with. Anything else, Dr. Scarlett, that you would like to raise after that? I think I think there's a, a lot to be explored and it's a, it's a constant in all of our lives. And I think just honoring that for yourselves too, as parents, um, that it's a lot for us to hold and go with that self-compassion route. <laughs> oh, uh, saying that, we have, uh, we have got some comments. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was a really rich talk with lots of, of content, which is fantastic. We don't um, tend to put the recordings out there, Elizabeth, um, but we're happy to uh, share maybe some slides. And uh, great if you want to contact us and ask any more questions about that and of course all of that will be explored during the workshop and um, that you know that was just a, a taste of, of what the song so uh, yeah there'll be very rich content in those and um we have a question what is considered an acceptable number of hours online daily oh this is a great question and there's a lot of research around this and we have to think um, in terms of what our brains used to do daily, you know, so if a child's supposed to sleep for 10 hours and be at school for another six, right? And then let's say bathing and meals and transport another two out, um, that doesn't leave many hours left in the day for, for friends, play, homework, sitting still and doing nothing. Um, and these are things that our brain needs. And one of the big ones that a lot of people forget about is play. Now, when children are small, it's easy. We put them in the, in the club or the backyard or at the playroom, and we just let them run around. They do it randomly. It doesn't seem organized. But we actually need play throughout our entire lives. Um, and we need about half an hour to an hour every single day of just play. And currently, it's online for a lot of people, just random play that doesn't matter. I know a lot of people say, how can I stop my child playing this? Well, if we give them a time limit, they need play. So we put that in there. If we say that school is taking up so much time and it's online then as well, it doesn't necessarily have to reduce screen time, but it does need to be taken into account because we're looking at optical development. Um, the eyeball reaches maturity at around eight, nine years old, they are the adult size. And then we have to remember if they've spent more than a certain amount of hours per day looking at the screen, we need them to focus on medium distance and long distance. So that reduces the amount of time, regardless of what international recommendations are, the amount of time that we would want them to be on a device that close to their face. Yeah, yeah. It, really, it really doesn't help for eyesight. And these are all the things parents are usually telling children. <laughs> but if we just find different ways to encourage them, say, yes, this time for, for these many hours, uh, sorry, for these many minutes, you can do that, whatever you want. All right, within these selected games, again, that would be an essential agreement between a parent and a child. If it's social media, they're doing it throughout the day. Um, I think that we can't quantify that time, but you can put one of those trackers on the phone that tells you how many hours they're doing a day. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to supplant that with a general question, how many conversations would they have with their friends in a day? <laughs> you know, if we add up the seconds of social media uh, and, and posts, it does that it called the old time that they would have spent just hanging out with friends doing nothing because there wasn't anything qualitatively different about just hanging out with your friends talking you know blue sky stuff they're just doing it online and probably more more intensely more quickly mm -hmm. so we have to be careful about how much time we allot there but if we compress it into probably two to three hours a day a little bit for play free play a little bit for friends mm -hmm. and then well, you know, as a kid, we used to sit and watch television shows in the evening when it was a special day of the week. And that was an hour or 45 yeah. minutes. Um, so there's, we have to consider when it's all done on one device, as I said, it feels like way too much time. And if we haven't taken time in between them to mm. change our eyes and our brain and our sensory input, it would be too much. But mm. if we put proper gaps in between them, there's nothing wrong with teenagers between the age of 12 to, well, upwards, having a couple of hours a day 
as long as it's interspersed um, in a way that is healthy. And as I said, they're doing normal things that we would expect a child of that age to do. It's just in a digital environment. Mm -hmm. And I do know tons of kids that sit next to each other. It used to be just 10 years ago playing Wii <laughs> or, or um, other things. Now it's all on the phone. Everything has turned into uh, the single virtual environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, yeah. that's it. But we have to roll with that. If that is their new preference, uh, because everybody can get on that platform and they play with more friends that way, we have to weigh that out. Yeah, but as long as the child understands 30 minutes to 40 minutes of that has got to be the max, um, then maybe we just put the boundary on that. Now, I have some yeah. students I work with and they say, but my friends are in the UK at school, so I have to stay up to 1 a.m. to play with them. Um, I don't want to play with anybody here. We never got away with that before because everybody went to bed at 8.30. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're out at the same time. Um, so we have a secondary effect of interrupting our sleep and our HPA axis, which is a little rooster in our head that wakes us up in the morning because of sunlight. When we spend too long with uh, the um, blue light from screens, it keeps it hyper attenuated. So it's activated for longer and it tells your brain, stay awake, it's still daylight. Um, and so it, it has secondary effects. Yeah. And there's a realistic thing there to balance with the timing on that. So maybe you pick the night of the week that they can do that yeah. instead of all that. But if that's their friends and that's how they can play now or communicate, and they'll be socially ostracized if they don't do it, has to be weighed up. But we've got to give them a chance to tell us that story. <laughs> yeah. 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 So many challenges, aren't there, for people? Yeah. There really are. And um, I mean, Alan's just pointed out here, but nowadays adults, um, you know, we're working at home, we're looking at the computer for the whole day. How do we explain that to them as well? Um, oh, and thank you, Mrs. Brow. Uh, Mrs. Brow, who just asked that, that question, is, is thanking you for that answer. So, um, but yeah, I mean, again, I suppose it does as, mod as modeling and having those open conversations, isn't it, Dr. Oh, but, you know, um, looking at a computer for the whole day, how do I explain that to them as well? And I, I, that is the, real, uh, the reality of the last year. And I've seen all kinds of wonderful solutions to this. And again, it's, it's a long list of solutions and it's about what your family can realistically do with everybody sitting in the household. Uh, aligning no lunch meeting uh, for the work is a little bit easier than telling a child to change the school time. So one of the best ones I'd seen was everybody gets up, turns off all of their devices, goes in the kitchen, cooks a predetermined meal, and everybody has a piece, whether it's setting up the table, sauteing the stuff, preparing the water, and then eat the meal together. You don't necessarily have to talk about what you just did, but just eating it together and talking about something fun. Mm -hmm. so little ways um, that you can do that not realistic for everybody, but if you just did it two days a week, we're not aiming for every lunch. It puts something in that wasn't there before. And it mm -hmm. tells the children, one, a meal is important enough to step away. Two, I'm not going to be slave to this either as much as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. And three, that they're important enough to talk to, that you, they're your most important client. You put them first. Yeah. And that's, it's an easy win um, if you can manage it. Now, the other ways that we model it for them is we do um, eye breaks, rest breaks. Lots of kids go from one thing, or oh, I finish the class, I'm exhausted, and they turn around and then do Roblox with their friends. <laughs> we just say, nope. If you were in the school hall roaming around, school policies, no phones, you would have roamed around and talked to two friends. One, call someone and talk to them. Two, go downstairs and see your friend for two seconds, or take a family five-minute walk. <laughs> it's uh, literally get up and walk out of the house. As I said, change the optics um, for it, both yeah. for our eyes and for yeah. our sensory input. When we change that, we're reprimed for learning again. By the way, uh, so having a little family um, weightlifting session, little family walk, little family mindfulness session. Although we, we'd want to avoid doing something that's just sitting again. Um, but this is it. It's it's a little bit artificial, a little bit pre-planned, a little bit manipulated, but we are all challenged with having to think about adding them in. Um, it's all too easy to sit for 10 hours straight, not feel your lower body anymore. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. No, great response. And, and we've got one more, if, if we've got time um, for it, Dr. Scarlett, from Sarah. She's just asking, how can we persuade children to avoid digital distractions at the wrong times? such as during lessons, so, uh, you know, for example, messages are more intrusive than the traditional note passed around in class, for example. Absolutely. There's there's um, uh, note passing. What a wonderful thing. Now note passing mm -hmm. happens digitally. Yeah. 
<laughs> I wish I wish we could do something so sweet and, and innocent. Um, really do. Uh, but the the difficulty with that is about managing it in the home. Uh, I understand that some parents uh, are both parents working, three children, all in different rooms. Very difficult to 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 manage that, and in some cases impossible. I'm not going to say that it is. There is a solution for every single one, but a lot of families have just found a way. In the same way, they get the child ready for this is work, this is school. They put them somewhere different in the house. The computers are not allowed to be in the bedroom anymore. They've moved them out to the dining table, and the dining table has been overrun, but so that everybody is there at the same time, and and knows that they're physically being observed. We also know that just moving them. Uh, some kids are staying in the bed all day. Um, and that doesn't tell our body, get up and do something different. And that also robs us from being on track. When we have all the environmental cues that say casual, it is another cue to go on and do a quick chat or a quick game or respond to a quick text. So I, as I said earlier, short of removing all the devices, blocking them, switching them off, I'm not sure that that is always the realistic option. In school, it's possible when we had them physically there. Um, Online, I don't know. You can get all of these apps on your computer now. WhatsApp is, um, you know, for the kids um, who are obviously so old using WhatsApp. Um, you know, they've got everything online. Snapchat and uh, Instagram have websites. You just log onto that page and you flick back and forth between the tabs. You know, it's, it's a household policy, no more than the school tab open at that time. You know, but then the screen has to be visible and somebody has to be doing a regular schedule of monitoring. Um, but the kids are very, again, very savvy at switching back and forth. I would be wary of creating a plan that you have to run after. I think it's easier to put the onus on the child to be demonstrating adherence to what it is, um, putting them in charge of it. As I said, we're trying to get them to, to grow that prefrontal cortex and get the connections for self-control. So empowering them to take that choice um, in a way that they choose. You say, I know you're going to be distracted. You tell me how you would do it challenge them <laughs> their brain is much more flexible than ours let them give them a go <laughs> absolutely yeah it is, it's about empowering them isn't it and you know we can put those guidelines in place and we have at school done some work with young people uh, in their tutor group about um, managing online distractions and uh, we can just give young people the tools and, and work alongside them but thank you Sarah for that question and Dr Scarlett that's all the questions that we have. Um, a huge thank you for your time this evening. A very rich and informative introduction to, I think, what will be a fantastic opportunity for parents and children at such an important age on opening the dialogue about digital devices. So thank you very much. And thank you, parents, for joining us this evening and uh, such great attendance. And uh, we hope to see some of you after Easter and we'll share the form with you tomorrow. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Scarlett. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye.